say at some point you, you would not want to head that ball. Yeah. Is anybody out there somewhere warm? Well, we had Philippines earlier. Yeah. So fairly warm in the Philippines, hopefully. Um, are you nice and warm, Mark? El Salvador, okay, yeah, yeah, that would be warm. Yeah, it's really hot, oh, nice. <laughs> Ecuador. Whereabouts, nice. in, whereabouts in Ecuador? I've been to Quito and Guayaquil, Bangladesh. Wow. So cool. That's the advantage of having these uh, Zoom sessions, right? Because then we can welcome you even if you are international at the moment, which is very cool. I love it. Love that idea. As difficult as technology can be. <laughs> It does make our lives easier and it certainly connects us. Yeah, forget the fact that they had to get up at three in the morning to uh, attend. Details, details, Sherry. That's dedication. <laughs> we welcome you so much, thank you. Awesome, I'm just gonna look at our numbers. Yeah, we're doing okay. Um, maybe I'll give it just one more minute. I do like to honor the people who came on time, but if someone is getting up at three in the morning, maybe we'll give them a chance to get some water and then we'll get started. For anyone who's just joined us, we're just talking about where you're from in the chat. So we've had quite a bit of international uh, people speak out. So that's been really fabulous. And we're just discussing weather because that's what you talk about, right? So um, just discussing the weather and how it's warmer pretty much anywhere else. No, that's not true. <laughs> we're not that cold. Apparently uh, Edmonton's colder with their soccer game. With their World Cup probably. soccer. Yeah. <sighs> that's crazy. That is crazy. Oh, there we go. We've got India. Nice. I'm looking, I'm actually looking forward to uh, ski season, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing for sure. Right by the Rockies here. Can't, uh, can't quite, can't quite beat them. They're pretty incredible. And it's been a couple years since I've been able to uh, do our normal December ski trips, so I'm hoping. Yes. So India, Bangladesh, Ecuador, Philippines, El Salvador, all those places sound like they would be really quite lovely to be at right now. Even Nepal. I think that would be, that's one part of the world I haven't been at. All right. So All we're right. Up, up to 44. So yeah. might as well, well get I did say one minute and that was three minutes ago. So <laughs> I just got all wrapped up in talking about warm places. Um, all right, we will get started. I just want to just shout out again. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, from wherever and whatever time, uh, we're happy to have you here. My name is Erin. Uh, I am a program specialist within the uh, Haskins School of Business, the undergrad program. And I'm actually just going to be recording the session. So just so you're aware of that, I am going to be starting the recording. So there we go. Um, again, I'm Erin, and I'm going to be your host today, but we are joined by some wonderful professor, instructors today, as well as our associate dean um, and some of my other colleagues, which I'm going to touch on momentarily. Um, but what I will do very shortly here and, and quickly is uh, I just want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, which comprise uh, of the Siksika, the Kani, and the Gainai First Nations, 
as well as the Tsutsina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the uh, including the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. So that is a land acknowledgement that we do here because we are privileged to be visitors here. And uh, whenever we hold meetings or presentations, we like to just do that land acknowledgement and state you know, the various tribes and First Nations that um, are home here. So thank you for, for that. Um, I will show you our next slide here, uh, just to kind of give you an idea of the agenda this evening. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna do a bit of an introduction. I'll introduce you to uh, the various players today. And then we are going to be moving into two mini lectures today. Um, as you know, you are here because you are hopefully interested in the Bachelor of Commerce program within the Haskane School of Business. And hopefully as a business student, when you come, you will be taking courses in these areas. So OBHR and OPMA uh, are a big part of your classes and potentially a concentration you might wanna focus on. So I won't go into too much detail about what those entail because uh, we have the experts here. Having said that, just a quick introduction to the various players. Um, we do have our Associate Dean of Undergrad um, Bachelor of Commerce program here, Miss Sherry Weaver, and she is, uh, has been already been chatting with you throughout the chat this, morning, this evening. So she's here to answer some questions and um, yeah, just simply uh, put a face to the name. So thank you, Sherry, for being here so much. Um, also, we have Leighton Wilkes, who is the Associate Dean of Teaching and Learning and the Senior Instructor today for OBHR. We also have uh, Brent Snyder, who is Teaching Professor and Academic Director for the Executive MBA, and he will also be presenting a mini lecture for us. And then we also have my colleague Stacey McGregor, who is actually going to be looking after the chat for me this evening. Um, I've only got one screen and I'm sharing it with you guys, so I won't really be able to keep up with the chat, but Stacy's going to do that. So if you have questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, they can range everything from content in the presentations, the uh, mini lectures, um, questions about the program, questions about admissions. Uh, that is actually going to fall to Carly Statue, uh, who is also on the call this evening, and she can um, field some of those questions as well. So we will, again, try our best to answer everything. Um, feel free to use the chat for that reason. We do have a little bit of Q&A um, built in throughout the sessions tonight, so you can also hold questions to the end for those. Um, but those are the major players, and of course, myself, Erin Zoni, uh, one of the program specialists within the Haskins School of Business. So I would help you with academic questions, as well as I hold half of the international exchange portfolio. So if you think about going on exchange later on uh, in your degree, I'd be happy to facilitate. And lucky you, my other colleague, Stacy, who is here today, does the other half of the exchange. So you've got the exchange powerhouse tonight as well as um, some incredible instructors at our associate team. So with that said, we are going to move right along here um, into what we're calling a taste of OBHR. And I'm going to let Leighton Wilkes kind of expand on that. But first, let me give you a short introduction. Uh, Leighton Wilkes is Associate Dean Teaching and Learning and Senior Instructor instructor, rather, for organizational behavior and human resources. Leighton has a significant consulting background in diverse areas, including real estate development, strategic planning, and cross-cultural training. In 2019, he was inducted into the University of Calgary Students' Union Teaching Excellence Hall of Fame, and also received a Calgary Award for Community Achievement in Education. So lucky you, you get to hear him give just a brief uh, taste of OBHR. So I will turn it over to him. I'm going to stop my sharing and let him take over. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Aaron, for the uh, the kind words. I'm just going to share my screen with everybody. 
Um, here we go. Should be able to see my screen, Aaron. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it? Absolutely. I'm getting the thumbs up. Uh, absolutely a pleasure to be here. Again, my name is Leighton Wilkes. I tell people, please, please, please just call me Leighton. Um, I'm the Associate Dean Teaching and Learning. So that means I, uh, I really help our instructors to be the best that they can be uh, in the classes. So when things like uh, COVID come up, uh, we can pivot online very quickly and, uh, and effectively. Uh, but perhaps the more interesting part of my job is that I'm an instructor in OBHR, which is organizational behavior and human resources. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of a sense of, of what that is, uh, the human resources, I think, makes uh, a more sense. So that's around uh, hiring the best people, you know, how much are we going to pay them, uh, compensation, um, and also a little bit around performance management, you know, how you get the best out of people. Uh, in my mind, the more exciting part, though, is the org behavior, which is sometimes a little confusing for people. Um, but that's really about, you know, managing people and, and how do we get the most out of people. So we talk talk a lot about psychology. We talk about things like personality and how that has an impact on our work. Uh, motivation, how do we motivate people? Uh, working with teams and groups. Uh, uh, bigger things like organizational culture uh, and what things are like and, and uh, ultimately things also like leadership. Uh, so it's, it's a really diverse area and it's a, it's a really fun area, but it, it's all really to deal with, uh, with people. Um, however, uh, I think the, the most interesting area is certainly around negotiations. Uh, uh, and that's my kind of specialty at Haskane. So I wanted to give you just a quick overview uh, of negotiations, give you an overview of my class, and, and hopefully take away a couple of things that can make you more effective negotiators in the future. So uh, with that, I'm just going to jump right into this, uh, what, I've, what I've called uh, effective negotiations. Um, so big picture, my overview is uh, a lot of people think about negotiations in a very specific way, uh, and that is called a distributive negotiations. Uh, we'll get to what exactly that means in a second. But, you know, really, when I think about this, um, everybody can be a, a great negotiator. Uh, but ultimately, preparation is key and doing your research beforehand. Uh, so I want to give you a few numbers or a few things to think about that might make you a better negotiator. Um, and something that I won't get into as much, uh, but uh, it's really the big part of my course is, is what's described as integrative negotiations. Um, that's also known as win-win negotiations. Um, and this is where truly, truly great negotiators uh, thrive. And I think this is where a lot of value is created for, you know, workplaces and also societies, uh, uh, but also your personal, uh, just, just effectiveness and how you get things done, right? Um, why? Uh, because oftentimes when we think about negotiations, we think, you know, big picture mergers and acquisitions, absolutely negotiations. We think buying a house, we think buying a car, you know, maybe buying a, a major appliances. Um, Absolutely. But I would like to say, um, you know, expand your idea of what a negotiation is. I think we all negotiate every day. Uh, we negotiate with our friends, with our family, with our coworkers uh, around things like just how do we get things done? You know, what are we going to do uh, with our free time? Uh, so my big thing is, you know, all of us negotiate daily. Uh, so we might as well be good at this skill. Uh, and like I say, it is a skill that we can all kind of master and get a little bit better at. Right. So, um, Having said that, just want to move on, uh, just a taste today. Um, a lot of people, when they think about negotiations, you know, they think of, uh, you know, Donald Trump, right? Uh, he literally wrote a book on negotiations. I don't know if it's worth reading. I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, you know, but but a lot of people think that, you know, the best negotiators are the people that that do the hardball tactics, right? That look across the uh, the desk from somebody else and, and can kind of grind them down. Um, and I really do like to challenge that. Um, but, you know, we do talk about hardball tactics. And I did just want to show you, you know, my favorite hardball tactic. Uh, and so this is a, a fantastic one, right? Um, here we go. I have a watch that I'm wearing. A lot of you may recognize this watch. It's a very famous watch. Uh, I am going to ask for somebody in the audience to please, you know, make me an offer on this watch. Oh, 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 Layton, I will give you 50 bucks for that watch. Aaron, do I look like a guy who wears a $50 watch? Don't answer that question, right? My kids have got to eat, right? Come on, I need a little bit more meat on the bone here. I need a little bit more money. Uh, come on, can you give me another, uh, another offer on this? And let's be serious about this. Okay, all right. Well, in that case, maybe, how about 75? 75, it's a done deal. Great. Thank you, Aaron, for playing along with that. 
Um, so that's a common negotiation technique. A lot of people do this naturally, um, but it's known as the flinch or the demur. Um, and all this is, is it's an extreme reaction to an opening offer. So um, if everyone knows this is an Apple Watch, right? No surprise. Um, you know, Aaron gave me this lowball offer, right? It's a lowball, it's a low offer for an Apple Watch. Um, and I had a bit of an extreme reaction, a little bit of an emotional reaction. Um, and so what this is designed to do um, is basically uh, uh, to let your counterpart or Aaron uh, know that, you know, his or her opening stance, her opening stance um, just is unacceptable to me, right? It, it's something that, that uh, you know, we need to move the needle a little bit. So why does this work actually, right? Um, I like it uh, because basically what it does is you can use this to make uh, uh, your counterpart make two concessions in a row, right? Um, so what Erin did was originally, if we look at it, she offered me $50 right? I did my little flinch, right? And it was a little theatric, you know, what did I give up? I would say I gave up nothing, right? I didn't give her any value. Um, what did she give up, right? She went from $50 to $75. That's $25 more in my pocket, right? What she doesn't know is this is a fake watch that doesn't work, right? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But right? So ultimately, I made her make two concessions in a row. And this is the first lesson, never ever make two concessions in a row right? You're negotiating with yourself. That's not what a strong negotiator does. So that's one of the things that the flinch does, which is an effective technique. The other thing that I like is that it can help me move what is called the anchor in my favor. Um, so what Erin did was she threw out a $50 lowball offer uh, with my watch. I didn't like that. So another way I could have played that uh, is I could have gone, you know what, Erin, that's a ridiculous offer, right? I'm doing my emotional thing. Let's be real. An Apple Watch is worth 400 bucks. I'm going to throw, pick up her $50 anchor, throw it over to the $400 range. So now the negotiation has moved from $50 to $400, right? And so that is the beauty of the flinch. Two very uh, simple things you can do to get more value, um, make your counterpart do two concessions in a row, or ultimately move that anchor in your favor. And we'll come back and talk about anchoring in a second because um, that's a, a very important topic uh, in negotiations. So there we go, uh, a little hardball tactic for you to go and use, and a lot of people do do this naturally. Um, getting to uh, the, the fundamentals of negotiation, um, one style of negotiation is what's known as distributive negotiation. Um, and that is where the goals of one party is just fundamentally in, in opposition to another party. And really when I think about this, you know, there's one pie at the table and my job is to get the biggest slice of that pie. So we think of a, a, a deal on, on uh, here we use Kijiji or, or uh, uh, you know, any kind of negotiation marketplace uh, where, you know, so it's really about money and, and as a buyer, I want the highest price and as a seller, I want the, uh, uh, or sorry, as the buyer, I of course want to pay the lowest price and as the seller, I want the highest price, right? Um, that is one form of negotiation and, and uh, uh, again, I think um, much more effective negotiators uh, uh, have another form of negotiation that I'll talk about in a second, right? But um, regardless, uh, when we're talking about the distributive negotiation or the more integrative win-win negotiation, uh, the key that I've already mentioned is uh, effective negotiation is all about 80% preparation. It's really about doing your homework. Uh, and then it's about 20% implementation or kind of the magic or the art of negotiation. It's, it's getting into the room and being able to read your counterpart uh, and, and, you know, give and take and, and do the negotiation dance, as I like to say it, right? Uh, a lot of people have this flipped. A lot of people think that great negotiators are just born. It's a skill you're born with or you don't have. Um, and, you know, those people, they think, I don't need to prepare. I'm just going to go in there and wing it. Um, and I think they really set themselves up for failure when you think about that, right? So do your homework, dig in, uh, and you'll already be better at negotiation. So in terms of like planning and prepping for a negotiation, um, ultimately at like the minimum, uh, these are four different kind of numbers that I would think about. And they don't always have to be numbers, um, but in a very simple negotiation, it would just be a number. Uh, so there's the target point or your aspiration point, uh, your resistance point or your walk away point, uh, a very specific acronym, which is known as your BATNA, uh, which is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Um, and then finally, there's that match 
magic like asking price or the initial offer. So there's another strategy I'll give you around that. Um, so going into any negotiation when I'm prepping, uh, I'm going to come up with four of these uh, uh, numbers, right? Just think about these four different things. And I want to walk you through each one of them. Right. Uh, so the first thing that I want to talk about is your target. Right. And, and basically your target is the goal in the negotiation. So in a very, very simple negotiation, um, what is your price? Right. What would you like to buy or sell the uh, item for? Uh, and really uh, like a target, like a goal, um, it should be realistic. You know, it should be based on available information. So it's not a pie in the sky thing. Uh, it is something that is realistic. Right. Um, and the research here is absolutely absolutely, absolutely uh, 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 firm. Um, people that have much more specific goals uh, do better in negotiations, right? Um, and the thing is, you know, everybody has one of these, right? A cell phone, this is my cell phone. Uh, we have all the information in, in all of human history at our fingertips, right? So I should be able to go in, take a look at my cell phone, you know, see reasonable prices and understand, you know, what I should buy or sell that item for, right? We have that information. So uh, big picture, you know, have that firm target, right? It's much better. You know, I want to sell my bike for $300, much better than a, a more wishy-washy goal of, you know, I, I just want to go in and get a good deal. Well, what is a good deal, right? Be firm, write it down. So that is your target, right? That's what you want to buy or sell the, uh, the item for. Okay. The next one, and, and this is what I love, it's called a bunch of different things. Sometimes it's called your resistance point. Sometimes it's called your reservation point. Um, but this is really the point at which you're indifferent to whether you achieve a negotiated agreement or not. Um, basically, it's the point is which, you know, you don't really uh, care if you get a deal or not, right? Um, and so uh, beyond your resistance point, uh, this is actually where you prefer no agreement, right? Um, and so, for example, again, you know, if, uh, if my wife watch, right? And I'm selling my watch to Erin and she already gave me a little bit of a low ball offer. Um, but really, you know, the lowest I'm going to accept for this watch being an Apple watch is $200. And that is firm. And if Erin doesn't come up to $200, I am willing to walk away. Right. So that is your resistance point, And it really prevents the negotiator from thinking with their heart and more with their head right? Because I might get wrapped up in a negotiation. I might actually like Aaron, right? Um, and I might say, okay, well, you know, she seems like a nice person. I'll give it to her for, you know, uh, $180. But really, that's a decision with my heart, not with my head, right? Um, so ultimately, your resistance point helps you to keep firm in that negotiation. And that is your absolute walk away point. Um, and ultimately, I say, you know, never reveal your resistance point to your counterpart. That is, if I went to Aaron and said, guess what, Aaron, the lowest I'm going to give take for this is 200 bucks, right? What is Aaron going to offer me? $200, right? So it's kind of a bad strategy to reveal the, uh, the resistance point. However, you may do it as a last ditch effort to save the deal. So, you know, Aaron and I were negotiating. Uh, she's at, you know, kind of $195. I'm at $205. I say, like, look, Aaron, honestly, the lowest I'll take is, is $200. Take it or leave it. Right, so it's it's a little bit of a, a a last ditch effort for a strategy, but that is your resistance point or your walk away point, right? So so far I've got my target or what I want to pay or sell the item for, uh, my resistance where I'm willing to walk away from this particular deal, um, and then there's a very negotiation specific term, um, and that is what's known as your BATNA, uh, which is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Um, all your BATNA is is really like what is your plan B. Right? What is going to happen if this negotiation is not successful? Um, sometimes you have a BATNA, sometimes you don't, right? But really great negotiators always try to find your BATNA um, because your BATNA gives you power to walk away from the negotiation. It's your plan B, right? And so a simple, simple way I have to explain this to people, um, you know, say four years from now, you have graduated from our BCom program. Congrats, right? That's fantastic. And now you're looking for that dream job, right? You have one job offer, right? Are you really in a position of power here? I mean, it's better than no job offers, but really, you know, how do you know if it's a good offer, right? How do you know if you could get more money, you know, that type of thing? I mean, you really don't, right? What though, what happens if this, right? You have an offer from a relative that says, hey, you know what? You can come and work to, for me tomorrow and I'll pay you $50,000. 
right? It might not be the best job, right? It might not be your dream job, but hey, at least you know you've got a plan B and that plan B is worth $50,000, right? It's your best alternative and it gives you power because then you can understand, you know, what that other job offer, it, uh, how, how attractive that other job offer is, right? So there we go. That's your BATNA or that's your plan B. Well, great negotiators always think about the plan B. Okay, one more simple number that I want to uh, uh, throw out there, um, and that is the magic of the opening offer. Or, you know, if I'm selling an item, you know, what am I asking for that item? Um, and this was a little contentious in the negotiation literature before. Um, and you know, some people said it's better to throw out that opening offer. Some people said it's 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 better to sit back and wait for that opening offer. Um, I think now we've kind of come to terms with that. Uh, and basically, you know, now the research suggests that it's it's much more efficient to make the first offer, right? Um, and this is in part due to my cell phone again, because we have that information at our fingertips, right? Uh, and so we should know what uh, uh, the item is worth, and then we can put out a reasonable opening offer. Um, but ultimately, it's due to that anchoring effect, right? And we saw that before with Aaron. Um, if I throw out the, the opening offer, you know, I put the negotiation range where I want it to be. Whereas if I leave that to Aaron, ultimately, you know, she can set that, that uh, anchor. And that's not what I want, right? I want to be able to control the outcome and the process of a negotiation. Um, very simple thing. We anchor just as human beings all the time. And this is where some of the psychology comes in, right? Um, this is a really, really famous experiment, right? Uh, it was done in the 60s, but I, I still like it. It's still relevant, right? Um, they gave people five seconds to answer this simple mathematic question, right? Uh, one times two times three times four times five, you get the picture, you can see it on the screen, right? Um, they, they posed the question this way. Um, and when they asked people to answer, the average answer was 512. Okay kind of interesting, but here's another interesting piece of this. They reversed the order of the numbers, right? So instead of the lower numbers where they'd anchor low first, they anchored on the higher number first. So they asked people the same questions. Um, I am not very mathematically inclined. That's why I teach people things. Um, but I do know that this simple mathematical question, right, the answer should be the same. Okay. Interesting though, when they asked people, what is the answer to the second question? It was a huge difference. Okay, uh, the, the, uh, the average answer, sorry, that should say the average answer uh, was 2,250, right? So just by anchoring on the big number or the little number, um, it changed people's answers significantly, right? Here's the punchline to my joke. What is the actual number? Uh, it's 40,320, which just proves that we're all kind of bad at math right? Deep down, deep down. I feel better about myself that way, right? Um, so there we go. The power of an anchor, even with a very, very simple uh, uh, mathematical question. Two more things and uh, I'll end at uh, seven. I think I had uh, 20 minutes. Uh, so um, just in terms of that integrative negotiation or that second piece, and this is really where my course uh, uh, focus is. Uh, so ultimately it's all, it goes by a couple of different names, right? Non-zero sum or just win-win negotiations. Uh, so before, you know, I talked about negotiation, there was a pie and my job was to get the biggest piece of that pie. Well, in integrative negotiations, really the thing is let's make a bigger pie. And if we can make a bigger pie, that means I get a bigger piece and you get a bigger piece. And that is where effective negotiations happen, right? And that's where we actually have to work together a little bit in order to build the pie and make it bigger. Okay. Um, there's a really famous story that kind of illustrates this. And I wanted to leave you with this story. Um, the story is always about two old ladies. Uh, I don't know why it's two old ladies, but I'm going to honor the tradition and tell the story this way. Um, so here it is. Two old ladies go down to a marketplace right? Both of them want a crate of oranges. Okay. It's the end of the day. Lo and behold, there's just one crate of oranges. So what do they do, right? They argue about it and they divide the crate of oranges. So one of the old ladies takes half of the oranges. The other old lady takes the other half of the crate of oranges, but ultimately neither one of them gets their needs met, right? Because both of them wanted the full crate of oranges. Next day, the two ladies go down to the marketplace. They've had some time to think about it, cool off a little bit. And they just ask one powerful question. And that is why, right? Why did you want the crate of oranges? The one lady said, well, you know, last night my grandkids were over and I wanted to give them fresh orange juice today, right? The other lady says, you know what? I just kind of needed the pulp and the peels to give to my animals to feed them, right? If you think about what just happened there, one of the ladies could have taken all of the juice, 
gotten all of her needs met. The other old lady could have taken all of the orange peels and everything that was left over, fed them to their, her animals and gotten her needs entirely met, right? Instead, what did they do? And they do what most people do. They split it down the middle. And that is a lose-lose scenario, right? And so really, when we start talking about the integrative or the win-win negotiations, it's all about asking why right? And why do you want things? And, and why is this important to you? Because usually in negotiations, we focus on the what. What do you want? And when you focus on the what, it really, really uh, uh, limits uh, solutions. And so we have to think cre uh, creatively, we have to think a little critically, um, and it's really focusing on that, you know, why question. And I think that's the most powerful question in, in uh, negotiations. Having said that, I have uh, reached the end of my time uh, for this little talk. Uh, I wanted to say thanks for listening to me. This has been fantastic. Uh, hopefully you can tell that uh, I'm passionate about this. Uh, and I will open the floor, I guess, to Aaron and any questions that people may have of me. Uh, and I will, uh, I will stop sharing my slides as well. Awesome. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Leighton. Um, I don't know about the Pleasure. rest of you guys, but I thought that was such a cool insight into the idea of negotiations. I just, wow, there's so much to talk about. Um, we're happy to open the floor to questions, but just to kick things off, Leighton, maybe if you could. Yep. Um, I'm just kind of curious. So you mentioned what OBHR is yep. and what it stands for, right? Organizational Behavior and yes. Human Resources. Uh, obviously a very cornerstone of, um, of any yes. business. Um, it is also a concentration area within the BCom. Yep. So just, you know, you're clearly passionate about this. Could you give us a, a maybe just a, what your thoughts are in terms of what it is about OBHR that, you know, drew you to it perhaps, and perhaps sure. what might draw other students to it? Yep. Uh, fantastic. So uh, great question. I mean, you know, I, uh, I actually didn't uh, do my first degree, my, my undergrad in, in business. I did it in psychology. Uh, so I always had a really uh, keen interest in psychology. Uh, and uh, then it, it, there was a natural fit uh, with, uh, with business uh, and, uh, and psychology in the OBHR area. Uh, and it's really just about, you know, people and it's about understanding people. Um, it's about working with people and working effectively with people. And really, you know, it's about how how do we get the most out of our people and the most out of our organizations? Um, you know, maybe the best way to say it is this. Um, you know, a, a lot of people in in the uh, in the uh, room here with us. You know, you're 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 in your early teens, uh, maybe early twenties. You've got a lot of years working ahead of you. Uh, you can go in and you can work for an organization that you love, and you're 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 uh, you know you go in every day and you you want to go to work and it it, it really excites you. Uh, or you can go into an organization and you can you know it can be a grind and you can hate it. Uh, and I hate to say this, but if you've got 45 more years of that, uh, it's going to be tough. So, you know, my mind is it, it, OBHR is all about, you know, how do we make organizations great? How do we make them uh, places we want to go in, places we want to work uh, with people we want to work with? Fabulous. I love that. Uh, and I love you're hitting on a really crucial point there when you say that, you know, I always say this too, as an advisor, you have the rest of your life to work. So, you know, you don't have to rush through your education, take the time to get your education and, and um, you know, spend that time. But exactly, if you're spending the rest of your life working, it's, it's important to do it with people and for people that uh, work together as well as they can and bring in the talents around them. Absolutely. Fabulous. Absolutely. Thank you for that so much. Um, I will start to load my screen again. Uh, but in the meantime, again, if you have any questions, feel free to either raise your hand or you can pop it in the chat. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to share my screen here and we can load up our next uh, presentation, our le next lecturer. Um, so we're going to move along here. We're moving into Opma now which is operations management. And we have Brent Snyder, who is going to be um, leading us in that lecture. Um, I'm just gonna give an introduction to him as well, and then we'll welcome him to the stage, the proverbial stage, as we say. Um, Brent has taught at Haskane for over 15 years and primarily teaches the Introduction to Operations and Supply Chain Management course that all BCom students are required to take, typically in their second or third year. 
Uh, he's won numerous Teaching Excellence Awards and his research focuses on teaching and learning effectiveness and innovations in management education. Brent is also the director of Haspain's flagship executive MBA program. So you might see him if you move into grad studies as well. So with that being said, I am going to stop my share again and uh, let, let Brent uh, take over. So over to you. Great, thank you very much, Erin. Uh, yeah, so as kind of mentioned, uh, I'm in the operations and supply chain management area, but uh, I'll admit it, I'm actually a CPA, I'm an accountant. I don't like to tell anyone, but uh, I do have that background as well. So maybe in the Q&A section, I can talk a little bit how I transitioned from accounting to uh, operations and supply chain uh, as well. So uh, what I've kind of done here is I find that a lot of people don't really know what operations or supply chain is. So I've kind of pulled together uh, a bunch of different slides just to give you a rough feel of these different areas, as opposed to uh, more of a you know targeted topic, just a, a feel of different things. Uh, and in operations and supply chain, it's about half math and half con conceptual, uh, but I'm not gonna make you do any math tonight, but I just wanna clarify that we do do a fair bit of numbers. <laughs> Sherry, yay, no math uh, tonight, but it is a key part uh, of our course. So before I start sharing slides, one of the things that I like to kind of summarize of what is kind of operations and supply chain is just a little bit of wordplay. The first thing is it's doing things better, more efficiently, right, more uh, um, accurately. So it's doing things better. But we also have a huge impact in operations and supply chain on sustainability, environment, social. So I also flip that around and talk about doing better things. So it's doing things better, efficiency, and doing better things, sustainability. That's the two that we really are in operations and supply chain. If that's a quick summary. So I'm just going to switch over here and share screen. And I've also got a couple little video clips. So hopefully the sound is fine as we go through this. But just going to start off uh, with kind of a, a quick little agenda of what uh, I've got here planned to go through. Is that visible for everyone? Okay. Uh, so I just thought I actually want to start off with a clip of operations management being applied at a New York City food bank. So you can see the results there and get a feel right away. It's just about a two or three minute clip. Uh, and Tesla has been a great example for us in operations over the last couple of years. Uh, they had some significant challenges and we'll talk briefly about how they address them. Then we'll talk about the supply chain and the triple bottom line. We know what the bottom line is. The bottom line is profit. But now organizations are being evaluated on more than just that. And it really is supply chain and operations that have the biggest impact. So if that is important, then we have to do better in operations and supply chain. Talk a little bit briefly about the impact of COVID on supply chain. You probably never heard the word supply chain so much as we had in the last 18 months, thanks to COVID. Uh, so a little bit of a chat on the impacts there. And then quality is another big topic that we go through. Uh, how do we make things better? And uh, two concepts there. One is fail-safing and the other one is checklists. And then just a summary slide at the end, letting you know that it's not all just these concepts that we do do a fair bit of math and application in the course as well. Uh, so you can see some pictures there. There is Amazon in 1994. It looks like they figured out supply chain pretty effectively. Uh, so we'll, uh, we talk about Amazon a fair bit in the class as well. All right. So our first thing, uh, there we go, is this was, I got into the heading here, operations management could be applied anywhere. A lot of people think it's just manufacturing. And it is not, it is manufacturing, it is services, it is nonprofit, it is every single organization having operations uh, and supply chain involved in it. And the best way to do this is just to show you a clip uh, of where Toyota, rather than donating money uh, to New York, New York Charity or a New York Food Bank, they actually donated their expertise and said, we know how to do processes. Rather than giving you money, maybe we can help you with your processes. So what they did here is that, I'll show you a different clip, but this one talks about how the engineers cut down the wait time for dinner uh, to 18 minutes from as long as 90, okay, just by changing processes. And initially they were quite skeptical, right? It says, Toyota has revolutionized the way we serve our community. Their initial offer to the charity back in 2011 was met with apprehension. They make cars, I run a kitchen, this won't work. As in, kid operations concepts be applied to something like healthcare or food bank? Well, they absolutely can. And this is kind of the quote here. It says, I never thought what we needed were a bunch of engineers. In our world, food is king, but we didn't know that the queen would be Kaizen, which is a Japanese term for continuous improvement. So I'm just gonna stop share and go over and start this clip for you. It's just a couple of minutes, but I found it quite powerful to kind of explain what is operations in a nice quick way. So we're just gonna get this switched over and started. 
And then hopefully the sound is there. When we down to our last box and you have like seven families standing on the line and you just have that one box and you don't know what exactly to do, that kills me. George is a great leader. He knows what he's doing, but um, they didn't really have a system kind of set up. Because if you have a good system, I think the work takes care of itself. We call TPS the Toyota Production System. The summation of many, many small, simple, cheap improvements can have a very big impact. People are starting to understand that these basic principles of the Toyota production system apply to any kind of process. It doesn't have to be a manufacturing process. We have our way of doing it, but if there's a faster way for us to go out and get food out to people faster, then I'm all for it. I'm all for it. What about a different box size? So that we're not shipping so much air. We could go to a smaller box where you have the benefit of being able to put more meals on the truck to serve more people. Watch the improvement the numbers. The benefit being it's not so difficult to handle. The thing that struck me was how difficult it was for the volunteers that were there to pack that box. They were walking long distances. They were carrying heavy weight. It was kind of just array, just the table in the middle. Everybody was scrambling to get stuff open. And I'm like, this is not really too productive. So by putting everybody on one side of the line and having the material come from the opposite, we think we're going to get a smoother flow. Yeah, let's go for it now. I don't, I don't, I don't care if I leave work. <laughs> I don't want you to have to walk 15 feet to go get those two cans of corn. I want those cans of corn to be readily available to you in the right quantity at the right place at the right time so that you can pack it in the box. Wow, this looks a lot different, doesn't it? It's cool, yeah. Anybody remember how long it was taking us to pack one box when we first started? Three minutes? Three minutes? That's exactly right. It was around three minutes, two minutes per box. What do you think we were packing one box? How long and how many seconds today? About 11 seconds. I was going to stop that one there, but hopefully that gave you a bit of a feel of what is actually happening in operations management and an example of it being applied not in a manufacturing environment. And again, it's about improving processes and maybe doing things a little differently than you've done before, but the improvements can be significant. Uh, so the next thing, we're just gonna go back into here. Sorry, let's hold on. And we're gonna share screen, go back to the slides. Here we go. Uh, and again, this is just another article that's on there about how the Seattle Children's Hospital used similar concepts from operations to improve uh, their uh, operations as well. But we're just gonna move on now. So we can get this thing clicking through. And again, Tesla is in the media a lot, uh, especially if you bought stock in it, uh, you know what's been happening. Uh, but it's really a great example for us in operations over the last couple of years, as they've been experiencing live and public some operational challenges. Uh, and I really like this article here. We know that Elon Musk is also involved in SpaceX and rocket science is easy, but making a mid-sized sedan is Elon Musk's hell. It is that difficult to actually do and figure out how to make that effective in operations. And here's some of the articles and clips, but here's a tweet uh, from Elon in 2018. Sorry, we've gone from production hell to delivery logistics hell, but this problem is far more tractable. We're making rapid progress, should be solved shortly. So they had one problem of a bottleneck in their production process. Once they solved that, the next problem was, well, how do we deliver? this many cars and the problems just kept occurring. And for us in operations, it was quite predictable and almost something that we saw a hundred years ago with Henry Ford just playing out yet again, a hundred years later with Tesla. So how did Tesla address their production hell and logistics hell's challenges? 
uh, some of the articles here. Uh, this one says, Elon Musk says humans are underrated, that he regrets using so many robots to build the Model 3. He was so initially proud of the machine that would build the machine. And then he found the huge bottlenecks and the lack of flexibility, ripped out some of the automation, put more people in and got production going smoother. So interesting lessons there. Uh, and another one here, this is exactly like Henry Ford in the Model T. Tesla reduces exterior color options to speed up production. This is exactly what Henry Ford did 100 years previous. Henry, Henry Ford had a famous quote that said, you could have any color Model T you want as long as it was black because of the efficiency that came from it. So it's interesting to see Tesla basically go through these similar challenges and learn them live again in front of all of us about 100 years later. But they've obviously been successful and things are moving in the right direction. Now, kind of mentioned this a little bit already, but in operations and supply chain, we have a huge impact on what's called the triple bottom line. So just to clarify, the triple bottom line is mentioned, we know the initial bottom line, right? The bottom line is profit. But if we exclusively focus on profit, we might be doing some things that are not that good for the planet or social responsibility. And therefore over time, although we're making a lot of profit, it might not be sustainable. One of these other ones may end up causing a significant impact and causing a problem for our sustainability. We could also look at this and say, well, we could be so environmentally friendly and so socially responsible, but we don't make any money. Is that organization going to be sustainable? No, you actually need all of these to sustain. And that's the challenge. And that's the reality now for organizations. And if you're looking within your organization to improve your triple bottom line, you could go to your accounting department, you can go to finance, you can go to marketing, but the number one place that hits all three is operations and supply chain. Efficiency up here, how we ship things, package things, how we deal with our suppliers and working conditions. If you wanna improve the triple bottom line, come to operations and supply chain. You'll never have a bigger impact than what we can do in our area. And because this is growing in popularity, operations and supply chain is also growing in popularity to accomplish it. Now, I'll just show you a little bit of a quick clip here, see if I can push your thinking a little bit further. The first thing is that some people are still having some challenges with the recognition that there is the triple bottom line. This clip is gonna push it further and ask you, is there a priority? Maybe one is more important than the others here. So don't have the answers, just some different thinking about this triple bottom line. And then we'll go a little bit further here. So let's just stop share and go back to our quick clip. Right here. Okay, here we go. The idea behind the triple bottom line is that businesses should give equal value to each of the three pillars rather than just looking at profit. When all three pillars are being respected, that is true sustainability. Some people have questioned this idea though, as it puts the economy equal with society and the environment. They argue that without the environment, people can't survive, and that without people, there can be no economy. So environmental concerns should be placed first. So different view there. Again, that's not established, but if you looked in the media over the last week or two about COP26 in Scotland, uh, I think you can see that there is some pretty big concerns about our environment uh, and the impacts that organizations and business is having on that as well. So let's just go back to our slides here. I got to watch our time. If we teach Atma, we got to follow it uh, as well here. So on this triple bottom line, one of the things is to start to look at is the environmental side and then the social side. So some of the things that we talk about in our course on the environmental side is how we ship products, okay? So rush shipping, it's a great thing with online purchasing, right? I can get stuff so fast. Rush shipping is often free, but the environment could be paying for it. They started offering options where you can have two day rush shipping for free, or you can choose green delivery to save 25 trees for free. And more than half of people are starting to say, you know, I don't need it that fast. I'd rather have it shipped a more environmentally friendly way. So by providing those options, understanding the carbon emissions of different forms of transportation, that's a key part of being someone in operations and supply chain, to understand those trade-offs and make that balanced decision. So lots on the environmental side. On the shipping considerations is also product design. Uh, I was just teaching this today in class, showing this to students that IKEA puts a lot of effort into designing the product for how it's shipped sometimes not necessarily what the customer actually wants. 
So this is a, a mug where they would originally get 864 mugs to fit on a pallet. You know, it's what shipped with a, with a little like pump truck that you've kind of seen and moved around. They added a rim so that they could be nested inside of each other. That's more in the same cubic space. And rather than 864, they got it up to 1,280 mugs on the same pallet. They did another redesign and were able to get it up to 2,024. It's like a competition at Ikea. How many mugs can you fit on a pallet? Just keep changing the design. Who cares what the customer wants? They're going to buy it anyway, it seems. From 864 to 2000, that's a huge increase. They reduced their cost by 60% for shipping. And therefore, when you sell 25 million mugs a year, that's a huge improvement. Okay? Uh, Ikea over here, I was talking about how they uh, design their products. If you've opened a box from Ikea, you see there's not a lot of wasted space in there. And different components are tucked in different areas to maximize shipping efficiency, giving us more to assemble, right? It's more work for us as a customer, but it makes shipping more effective. And it talks about how it saves 50% 50, 50 on shipping costs, the way that it kind of designed that. Uh, this picture up here, I always kind of smile at it. Maybe it's just my weird supply chain mind looking at it, but I think it's beautiful. And the reason that it's beautiful is that these four boxes fit so perfectly on that pallet. What if they designed that product to be two or three inches longer? Is that going to be a problem? Absolutely, that's a huge problem. Somehow those designers considered supply chain considerations and made things all work out. Or maybe it was the other way around and Ikea supply chain people went to the designers and said, it has to fit within this palette, figure it out to make that work, okay? So we talked about the triple bottom line. How does designing a product for efficient shipping impact Ikea's triple bottom line? From a profit standpoint, it's reducing shipping costs, right? From an environmental standpoint, it's reducing carbon emissions. It could be win-win. It's not necessarily a trade-off there. Now on the social side, this is an article we were just talking with last week, uh, or sorry, two weeks ago in class. And this is talking about the fashion industry uh, where China is turning Ethiopia into a giant fast fashion factory. And we had the students read an article and just have discussions about this. It says we've arrived at a new moment for the global apparel industry. This drought afflicted landlocked country of 100 million in the Horn of Africa is transforming itself into the lowest rung in the supply chain that pours out fast fashion and five for 12.99 tube socks. Lured by tax incentives, promise of infrastructure investment and ultra cheap labor, countries the Western world once outsourced production to, China and Sri Lanka, are now the middleman ramping up production in Ethiopia for Guess, Levi's, H&M and other labels. And is that a good thing? What are the implications from profit from environmental, from social. And it's really interesting to see students engage and argue with each other and challenge them to have their thinking, would you source production, why or why not? If you were a citizen of Ethiopia, would you support that government's uh, you know, plan to transition to fast fashion? And here's an interesting one too, is on the environmental side, if you want to, I to kind of challenge you, take 30 seconds right now and just Google, how much water does it take to make one t-shirt? Google that right now, put it in the chat. Tell me how much water it takes to make one t-shirt. And does that align with what you think when you think of Ethiopia, okay? All right, so other things from a supply chain standpoint, you've heard of this a lot again because of COVID and some of the challenges, but also how fast things were able to come back. We still have shortages on, on certain things. It seems to be pretty regular. Uh, what is the best way now? We've recognized that there was a lot of global outsourcing. There's a lot of interruptions trying to get the things coming back. Well, what should we outsource? What should we keep close? I like this headline here, how the world's richest country ran out of a 75 cent mask. A very American story about capitalism consuming our national preparedness and resiliency. When do you outsource? When shouldn't you? Is it strategic? These things are all coming into question now because of COVID. Can companies avoid risk by choosing suppliers closer to home? What are the benefits? Lots of discussion, triple bottom line impacts as well that we talk about in these topics. Now, the last little thing that I wanna go through is quality. We talk a lot in our course, a couple of weeks on how to improve quality. And the kind of process is that we wanna be able to monitor a process and have alarms in place. So we teach different ways to put things in place so that if something bad happens, we internally find out fast uh, ourselves. So what are different monitoring techniques? When we do notice a problem, how we do the investigation, we go through quite a few different tools like that in our class. And then more importantly, stop it from happening again, right? The prevention, the idea of fail safing and checklist to improve our quality. Now we do a lot of numbers in quality, but from a conceptual standpoint, I wanna give you two examples. The first one is on fail safes. And I really like this one. Uh, students are really connected with this one. Look at this example, a five cent self-destructing syringe. So back that up a little bit. It's very cheap, intentionally breaks self-destructing 
syringe. Well, how many times should you use a syringe in this world? Once. If it intentionally breaks after the first use, could that prevent problems? It could. Fail safe the design. So what is this? The syringe's plunger breaks when it's pulled back for reuse. You can see how it's retracted inside. Cannot possibly be used again once it was used once. Why? 1.3 million people die every year because of the reuse of syringes, according to the World Health Organization. A syringe is used four times on average in the developing world. That means half of the time, it's more than four. In Africa, 20 million injections contaminated with HIV are given each year. After seeing undercover video of a children being injected with used needles, in one case, a nurse used a syringe on a man with HIV and syphilis, then reused the needle on a one-year-old baby. Tanzania has become the first country in the world to exclusively use auto-disable or self-destructing syringes to prevent that. So we talk a lot about how can you prevent problems from ever occurring. This is just one of many uh, examples. Uh, then they got this more popular and the WHO uh, has urged this as well. In Canada, we don't have this regulation right now. We can have syringes reused here in Canada. We just have to hope that our healthcare system does not have the problem. In this case, this is an initiative to make it impossible to be reused. Okay, so uh, we don't have time, but it's an interesting TED talk of the founder of this talking about the impacts of it as well. So fail safing is one way to prevent the problems. Another one is to have checklists and checklists are effective and efficient. Those are two great words for us in operations, right? It works and it's fast. Those are things that we love in operations. It formalizes previous lessons learned. Why do you have it written down on the checklist? Because you forgot it once before and something bad happened. The lesson is don't forget it next time. So these checklists are powerful. We live in a world where there's just so much information now, it's impossible to remember everything. If you write it down on a checklist, you can actually reduce all that anxiety and be more comfortable just doing the job and making sure that everything is covered. Typical improvement of checklists, it's immediate, it's significant. There's actually a book called The Checklist Manifesto uh, that I know my executive MBA students love. Uh, and from an undergrad standpoint, we just kind of talk about it, how you design an ideal checklist. And here's an example of it being applied in healthcare. So it says here, a recent John Hopkins study claims more than 250,000 people in the US die every year from medical errors. Other reports claim to be as high as 440,000. Okay? Medical errors are the third leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer because there's so many different procedures, so many different drugs, so many different steps, it's impossible to remember everything. So they're trying to get checklists in many different places. We have them in airlines, we have them in building code, trying to get them in healthcare. And after three months of using these checklists, major complications were down 36%, deaths were down 47%, huge improvements on just applying a basic tool in operations, in this case, to healthcare surgery. So just kind of a different application of it. This is actually, a checklist from Safe Surgical Checklist from the World Health Organization. And I like to joke with my students, if you're going in for surgery, you might want to tape it to yourself because problems still occur here in Canada. These are things to check. Look at this one. Before the patient leaves the operating room, look at the thing to check here. Completion of instrument, sponge, and needle counts. Why do you have to count those? You want to make sure it's not left inside the patient. Like it still keeps happening in Canada and Alberta is not doing that well as well. Okay. There's just too many things to remember, but with fail safes checklists, we can improve quality and reduce all that remembering that we expect people to do in a healthcare process. Last thing is just mentioning, we do a lot of numbers in class. I'd say operations and supply chain is about a 50-50 mix. Uh, I didn't make you do any math, but don't think that that's not the case. When we're trying to figure out the best way to do things, often we're trying to optimize or do a calculation to figure things out. So lots of numbers on things like how long will a project take? How much inventory should we order? When? Is that product guaranteed to meet certification standards? We can run all the numbers, do the testing, and figure this out and make a recommendation that's very kind of clear from a numerical standpoint. All right. So that was my last slide. So I'll just stop there. Back. I think we've stopped. Amazing. There. Thank you so much, Brent. Really appreciated that. Uh, yes. Yay. Applause, applause. Um, <laughs> Yes. So I'm going to ask kind of a similar question. You mentioned that you are a CPA, so you your background is actually accounting. But what was it that you drew you to operations management and might perhaps uh, draw other students to it as well? Yeah. So for me personally, I, I did an accounting because my dad was an accountant. That seems to be a pattern I find with a lot of students in my classes, right? That's a key influence and guaranteed jobs with accounting. And I started doing that and found within the first couple of years, it wasn't speaking to me. I didn't want to get up in the morning and go to work. I didn't, I didn't have a joy 
in doing accounting. I was good at it, but it didn't make me happy. And then, then what I was able to find at that company was starting to implement a software system. And in order to set up the automated accounting that they tasked me with, I got to go to the shop floor. I got to meet with customers. I got to go see suppliers. And I said, whoa, this is way more interesting than looking at Excel and doing reconciliations for me. The biggest thing that I found that stood out to me is I found accounting, and I'm not trying to be mean here. It's just my personal interpretation. I found accounting was sitting on the sidelines of a game. It was the scorekeeping. It was telling me what happened yesterday in the game. I'd rather play in the game. And that kind of spoke to me. I'd rather be coaching or an actual player than the scorekeeper in a game. And what I found with operations and supply chain is I can actually make a difference. I can make a difference in my daily life. I can make a difference in the world by changing how we do things environmentally, socially, inspiring others to look at things in a different way rather than keeping score of what happened. As I like to say now, I don't need a scorekeeper. I played the game. I can tell you what happened. I don't need the score after. So um, I highly value accounting. It was good for me in my career. But for me personally, I wanted to make a difference and I wanted to interact with people. And I didn't get that from accounting. So uh, my dad still talks to me. Don't worry. Uh, everything's fine uh, from that standpoint. But uh, the biggest thing for me is uh, I wanted to be in the action and I wanted to make a difference. And that's what I found in operations and supply chain. Awesome. What a great answer. Thanks, Brent. Um, thank you both again so much for your uh, presentations today, your mini lectures. Um, so Leighton and Brent are instructors within the Bachelor of Commerce. You will see them again. Um, so hopefully we will see you, uh, see you guys in the classes with these instructors. So just yay, mm -hmm. round of applause. Um, what I will say, though, is that I recognize we are over time, uh, just because this is also interesting. Uh, I'm even learning more, and I took the BCom. I won't say how long ago, but um, anyways, I just want to say that if you have to go, we completely understand that. Uh, anyone who registered will receive a copy of this recording. So while we are going to keep going, uh, we recognize if you have to leave, you're welcome to do so. Um, but otherwise, I'm just going to go into just a couple key points about um, the Bachelor of Commerce itself, if you'll permit me. So um, essentially, I just want to give a couple key points about Haskane and the Bachelor of Commerce with the Haskane School of Business, because obviously you guys have choices. You know, you can look at other universities, um, you can look at other programs, um, but of course, we would prefer that you came to us and you've seen some wonderful instruction um, and instructors today as, as evidence of that. Sherry is also here, our Associate Dean, very involved Associate Dean, um, coming to events like this as well, uh, and happy to, to speak to our prospective students. Um, we are just going to talk a little bit about the Bachelor of Commerce. It's a four-year program, and it aims to provide the next generation of business professionals with fundamental business knowledge. Through a variety of in-class and experiential learning opportunities, you will develop the business skills needed to successfully begin your career. Haskane professors combine theory with practical experiences, which you no doubt picked up on just now in your uh, mini lectures. Um, and it allows you to apply your learnings to solve real world organizational problems. Business community professionals and experts will play an important role in your Haskane experience, contributing as mentors, advisors, and guest speakers. Uh, they build life, you'll build lifelong connections and friendships as you embark on this transformative undergraduate experience. Uh, just a couple numbers for those who are, who are into numbers in the audience. Haskane has nearly 4,000 full and part-time students enrolled in a range of programs, including that BCom. Um, an important member of the Canadian and international business communities, Haskane maintains partnerships spanning the globe and an alumni network, myself included, of almost 30,000 across 90 countries. Uh, there's many ways to customize your BCom degree as well to suit your strengths and long-term goals. You can do this through things like combined degrees, over 10 different concentrations, two of which we touched on today, OBHR, OPMA. There's a course, accounting, finance, um, uh, international business, which is what I did. Uh, and as I said, there's over 10 different ones. You can add minors, you can embed certificates. You, there's co-curricular skills and experiences offered. Um, HSB, so Haskane School of Business, is the first business school in Canada 
to develop a formal co-curricular record program. So we call it the BOLD program. And BOLD helps you to develop your professional and core skills, which are required to distinguish yourself when searching for a job. So it's actually a platform that assists you in your co-curricular activities. You gain points for it. It's a very cool system. And it, as mentioned, is the first of its kind. Uh, we have just so much to offer, and I'm just going to do a very few pieces here. We're going to throw some links in the chat, um, but essentially we have over 16 clubs within Haskane itself. We have a business library. So there's a library on campus, but we have one that's specific to our business school. It offers guides, workshops, tutorials, research guides, databases, and help in all aspects. We do have a co-op and internal career center. So you can earn while you learn if you're doing the co-op program, full-time work experience while getting credit as a full-time student and unique to Haskins School of Business, one of the only faculties to have their own career center. We do case competitions. Uh, we have the academic development specialist in-house as well for any kind of academic concerns you might have. We offer exchange, which I touched on and is part of my wheelhouse and my co colleague Stacy's wheelhouse. Um, and we have uh, recently recorded a great panel. So that's what the link is here, where we called it uh, Haskane Students Spill the Tea. And basically they talk about their experience here. And we also have a link to show our new building, which we're really excited about. The chat link uh, is going to be in there as well. But again, we're going to um, be sharing this because as you know, we're recording it. So uh, you can, or you will be able to click on the link right in the presentation when it comes out. Um, but it's from Matheson Hall, which is our new building that's coming out. So uh, I threw that at you really quickly. There are some key contexts here. As you can see, we have a very robust and up-to-date website. We have an incredible lady in-house helping us with uh, communications. And um, she helps post all kinds of things for the undergrad program specifically, um, but also, of course, we have an, an in-house communications team. Um, we'd love to hear from you guys. So feel free to reach out to us. There is the link there to actually do um, a drop-in advising session with us, or you can certainly and always feel free to connect over email, which is also there. It's undergraduate at haskane.ucalgary.ca. And of course, if you have any admission questions, there is the Future Students website, um, as well as Carly, who's here tonight. Um, so I just want to thank you so much for joining us. We'd like to know that it is in your benefit to apply early. Uh, please feel free to be in touch if you have any questions. Um, we can't help you if you wait and all the spots in the program fill. So reach out to us. Um, and at this time, we're happy to stick around and answer any remaining questions you may have. Uh, I thought I saw a few come in for the instructors as well. So uh, Brent is still with us. I don't know if Leighton had to go, but um, either way, you know, we're happy to answer as many questions as we can, uh, understanding that we've kept you very long already. So thank you again so much. And uh, let's field some of those questions. Yay! <laughs> open, open us up here. Um, I'm going to stop share actually so that I can see if any hands shoot up. Okay, so we've got a question here. Tell us about the risk management and insurance concentration and the one including finance. So you're probably talking about what we call ARMIN or ARMIF. <laughs> um, so I don't know, Sherry, did you want to talk about concentrations at all? Do you want me to jump into it? Uh, she's shaking her head. That's cool. I can talk. Okay, great. <laughs> With the um, risk management, uh, it's one of the areas that is so important in business. And one of the things that when I talk to um, our industry advisory group and we, we pull them and we ask, ask people in industry, CEOs, uh, those that are senior management, what keeps them up at night? And they tell us uh, risk management. Uh, it is something that 
is very pervasive. And nowadays, you, tying it into that triple bottom line, risk management is also extremely important to always think about um, what are the possible risks? What are the probabilities of the risks? What are the outcomes and the costs? How do I mitigate it? Uh, risk management has a lot of different areas. Um, so you could be looking at risk management from a, perhaps an insurance point of view, from a financial point of view. How do you, how do you manage your risk using um, financial instruments. Uh, and then also, uh, we have quite a few students that do both risk management and actuarial science. So um, that's, uh, there, there's lots of opportunities to um, take a look at concentrations, as well as pairing it with a minor or another degree in a combined degree. Um, the business technology management concentration, a lot of that is, we used to call that IT uh, and information technology, but now it's, um, it's expanding quite a bit more. Um, we've paired that also with business analytics and I teach in that area as well as operations. And um, with that business analytics, you know, we're looking at things like AI, machine learning, uh, some coding. I do a lot of computer simulations and uh, optimization in my area, um, uh, which is a cross between healthcare and uh, operations and data analytics. My background um, is actually engineering. So all of us today, been, you know, whether it's Leighton or Brent or myself, none of us actually um, started where we ended up. And that's great. Like I, I try to encourage students not to worry too much about picking what you want to be for the rest of your life. Nobody wants to do that. Um, find something that you're passionate about and you'll stick with it as long uh, as you want until you start to see something else bright and shiny and you'll move into that. And everything that you've learned is transferable. So don't worry about it. Can I just share something about hearing students over all the years here talk about concentrations? I actually think that it's important to emphasize you're getting a Bachelor of Commerce degree and the concentration just means that you took some elective classes in an area that other students didn't take elective classes in. And that really is the key. You're getting a business degree that you specialize in certain areas. Uh, I find there's a lot of worry about what concentration am I in? One of the things I'd recommend is why don't you come to my class, to Layton's class, all these, what we call our 317, those core required classes. And then once you've seen a little bit of accounting, a little bit of finance, a little bit of marketing, a little bit of operate, then decide. Don't feel that you have to make that decision up front. I think it creates a lot of worry and anxiety. And how do you make a decision when you don't have the information yet? So think of it more, in my opinion, um, as being a Bachelor of Commerce student. And yeah. you're going to choose later on what elective classes you want to take. And I, hopefully that, that's okay to say, Sherry. I, I've just seen too many students in my class quite worried about that. Oh, it's, yeah. And we try to tell students, don't even bother picking a concentration when you do your application. You just uh, click the drop down menu that says concentration business. You can switch later on if you really want. Concentration is maybe five, six courses. Um, you take 40 courses in your Bachelor of Commerce. Uh, those few courses in that concentration area, um, it's very small and um, it's, it's not even on your diploma. Uh, so, you know, it's gonna go, it, it's not as nearly as important. And when we talk to employers, they say, we want, you know, good, well-rounded, um, students with a lot, a lot of breadth that really understand business. So uh, some of our best students uh, stay as business concentrators and pick, a, pick the courses that they want from across the school. So you don't really need to, like, I would not be stressed out about it at all. Um, and uh, that's one of the messages. And thanks, Brent, for bringing that up. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks, Sherry, for taking on the concentration um, questions. Uh, Stacy has also put a link in here uh, for that. We do actually have a web page designed to show you 
all about the various concentrations, the best people um, to contact, or at least the first point of contacts for those areas. Um, some of them even show what previous graduates with those concentrations have gone on to work in, what fields and what positions. Um, so those are great. But Brent brings up a really good point. You are coming out with a Bachelor of Commerce degree and the concentration really only makes up about six to seven of the courses you're taking out of the entire 40 course degree. So it is not um, going to, it's not going to um, pigeonhole you or it's not going to define the rest of your career. Um, it is meant to give you the opportunity to get a little bit deeper into one area um, but it is not, uh, it's not necessarily, as Sherry was saying, what the, the employers are focusing or fixated on. Um, we did have someone ask about exchange, so I will just kind of briefly over, over give the overview of that quickly. Um, myself and my colleague run the International Exchange Program through the Haskins School of Business. As a business student, you can go to a bunch of our partners and take actual business classes while you are abroad. So you can spend a semester in Europe or somewhere in Asia or somewhere in the Pacific or potentially um, doing what we have at semester at sea where you're actually spending it on a boat going to a variety of different countries uh, while still studying courses that count towards your degree. So we work with you from the academic standpoint as well as the actual application to go abroad um, the idea behind it is that we want you to go. We want to help you go. We want to help you get that international experience. Um, so we are, you know, on your side. We're trying to make you successful. So, of course, we do our requirements in terms of GPA and what courses you have completed to uh, qualify to go. But uh, we're on your side, right? We want you to go. And um, we have quite a number of different partners around the world. Um, Stacy, my colleague, looks after kind of the Europe region. I look after the Asia Pacific region. Um, and one thing to really note is if you are thinking of going on exchange through the Haskane School of Business, the biggest kind of takeaway maybe today would be that it's something that you look at later on, closer to like the third or potentially even fourth year of your degree. And the reason for that is because business courses where they start to get really into the meat of courses happen at your third, fourth year. So we want you to be prepared for that. And we want you to have the amount of content behind you for you to be successful in those courses when you're abroad. So um, it's more something that we would be looking for in another couple of years, but we're happy to obviously have those preliminary discussions. So awesome. So I know there's been a couple uh, messages kind of coming along um, and uh, essentially, Sherry has to meet to go negotiate with her dog. So she's just had to step away here. Um, but essentially, we are really happy that you're able to join us. And one of the final kind of questions that we're going to leave you with today, we have um, kind of the perfect wrap up question here. Why do you believe your business program is better than others? So Sherry, maybe I'll leave that with you. Um, because I can list many reasons, but uh, I feel like it would be better coming from you. So I will leave it with you. Oh dear, you're still muted, my friend. I had to mute because my dog was driving me nuts and barking. So I tried some of Leighton's negotiation techniques um, and I relented more than twice. So I think I lost. The, um, in terms of, our diversity here at Hasgain, um, I would probably, you know, we have uh, approximately 17% international students plus exchange. And you'll definitely find that the student body is um, quite diverse. Um, and Calgary, Calgary can be a very diverse city as well. Um, we are looking at uh, probably in having the same number of international students, maybe a little bit higher this year, because um, for the last couple of years, unfortunately, a lot of our international students weren't able to uh, attend, in, you know, outside of their countries. So, I, I think uh, uh, I, I think we are a very uh, 
diverse school. I'm also chair of our uh, equity and diversity uh, committee that at, here at Haskin. And so we are making quite a few uh, changes in order to increase that diversity as well. Um, I'm trying to remember, Erin, um, how did, oh yeah, how does our business program stand out from others? So I'm just actually in the middle of um, helping a, a rather large committee um, of our academics and we're, we're helping to redesign our BCom um, program. And actually as an incoming student, you will uh, be able to see some of those changes. We are really focusing on um, social, um, that social contract. Uh, we want to make a societal impact and uh, social entrepreneurship is a huge area. So what you'll find is that our school is very active when it comes to uh, case competitions, experiential learning. Uh, we have very strong ties with our uh, downtown partners. And so we're bringing them into class uh, all, all the time. And I actually find, um, one of the upsides of COVID has been that we've learned that we can bring people in from around the world. And uh, that really does help expand some of, uh, some of the things that we experience in business. So uh, between uh, honors programs and our exchange programs and our co-op program, uh, our, our regular, regular BCom and all the many areas that you can focus in, um, as a school with about 3,400 <coughs> undergrad students, um, we have a lot of programs that we do offer. So uh, the biggest thing is just making sure that you take advantage of it. So Fabulous. anything else you want to add? Thanks, Sherry. Um, yeah, I mean, I did my degree here and I just loved how much uh, of a family it felt and you, you get the impression that your instructors care about their subjects. Uh, as you saw today, hopefully, they're both very passionate about what they're doing. Um, and for me, it was, it was the relevance of what I was learning. I could apply it immediately and I could see how it makes a difference immediately. And so that was, that was a big piece for me. And that's where that experiential learning comes from. So um, there's just one little question there. How big are the class sizes? Uh, they range, but I would say, you know, I, I, 80, I think was the biggest I remember, 80 or 90. Um, there might be some larger ones uh, if you're taking like an option, right? They can be as big as the two, three, 400, um, but, at the same time, you often have a, have a tutorial where you can, um, you know, meet more like 50 or so uh, at once. And then instructors always have office hours. So you can always approach your instructor as well if you need to one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but yes, Sherry has, has mentioned 40 to 80 in Cascade. That's kind of what I remember. So uh, we are going to cut it off though, because it's getting quite late and we have already you so much of your time, Sherry and Brent. Thank you so much, as well as all of our attendees. Thank you again for coming. Um, but we're going to let you go and enjoy the rest of your evening uh, or morning, depending on where you are. And again, this will be available afterwards. So thank you again for attending. And uh, we hope to see you in the fall, if not earlier. <laughs>